Hello, George Romanich here. Today we are going to talk about gradient wind balance. What is this video about, you might say? This is one of the most important videos on this channel because gradient wind balance is one of the most important, quintessential concepts in atmospheric sciences. Gradient wind balance is achieved when there is equilibrium between pressure gradient force, Coriolis force and centrifugal force. All of this is in horizontal plane. You will kindly remember that geostrophic wind balance was achieved when there is exact equilibrium between pressure gradient force and Coriolis force. And that happens when the isobars are straight lines and in northern hemisphere wind blows in a way, geostrophic wind, that right uh, to the wind is high pressure and left to the wind is low pressure. Now, gradient wind is generalization of this concept when we have curved isobars, so we have to introduce centrifugal force. Which means, if isobars become to be straight, gradient wind balance degenerates into geostrophic wind balance. In addition, to talking specifically about gradient wind balance, today's video will also explain basically flow kinematics in anticyclones and cyclones in our atmosphere. And if that is not important concept, then I don't know what it is. However, that's not the end. I will completely blow your mind by demonstrating today using gradient balance equation that weather in terms of wind dynamics or winds rather, close to the center of high pressure systems have to be weak. And you will see today why we say that anticyclones are associated with dull, calm weather, no winds, whereas cyclones can be associated with extremely high winds close to the center of cyclone. That follows directly from mathematics and physics reasoning that we will talk about today. Now, gradient wind balance is also more complicated than geostrophic wind balance because there is this threesome of forces and each of them can be balanced by other two. So, for example, pressure gradient force can be balanced, on the other hand, with centrifugal and Coriolis force, only centrifugal force can be balanced by the other two forces and so on. So there are many different possibilities that, that these three forces can balance and that's what we will also investigate today. So this video might be a little bit longer, but if you are interested in atmospheric dynamics, then this is alpha and omega. So let's start. Let's review what was geostrophic wind. You will remember if we have straight isobars, and let's say here is pressure P, here is pressure P minus delta P, where delta P is some positive number, then we will have geostrophic wind Vg in the northern hemisphere being such that the high pressure is to the right and low pressure is to the left when we look down the wind. However, what happens if we now have curved isobars like so? And let's take the same pressure distribution P and P minus delta P. Well, in this case, we have pressure gradient force acting in this direction. And we have, Cori this is direction of the wind. We have Coriolis force acting in this direction. So let me write pressure gradient force, Coriolis force. But notice that there is now also another force that is acting radially out and namely that will be centrifugal force which means that in this case this Coriolis force really has to balance both centrifugal force and pressure gradient force and the wind that blows in these situations is called gradient wind. So we can see that geostrophic wind is special case of gradient wind when there is no centrifugal force, 
and we will have absence of centrifugal force if these isobars are straight lines. Now to quantitatively investigate gradient wind, we start with our horizontal momentum equations in natural coordinate system, and they are dv dt is equal negative delta phi delta s and v squared over r plus f v is equal negative delta phi delta n. However, gradient wind is balance, which means there is no accelerations, which means accelerations along the trajectory, which means this is zero. And now we can solve this equation for uh, V, noticing that if we have balance between pressure gradient force, Coriolis force, and centrifugal force, this velocity is this gradient velocity. Of course, for, for those of you that are new to my channel and you didn't watch previous videos, you should know that phi is geopotential, phi is gz, where z is height, g is acceleration due to gravity, f is Coriolis parameter, 2 omega sine phi, where phi is latitude, omega is angular velocity of earth, and r is radius of this curvature uh, over here where this is the center of the curvature. And n is this radial direction perpendicular to the velocity vector. By convention, define in a way that n is positive when it is to the left of the motion. So in this case, you can see it would be negative. Okay, that was two-minute review of natural coordinate system. So if we solve this quadratic equation for v gradient, we will get that it is minus fr over 2 plus minus square root of f squared r squared over 4 and minus r delta phi delta n. And this is powerful gradient wind approximation. You can see immediately it is more complicated expression than what we had for cyclostrophic wind balance or inertial wind balance, inertial oscillations. We can rewrite, if we want, this pressure gradient term using geostrophic wind balance. You know from my video on natural coordinate system that geostrophic wind negative delta phi delta n is equal f v g where g is the geostrophic wind check that video which means we can also rewrite now this equation to be minus f r over 2 plus minus square root f squared r squared over 4 plus f r v g where g is geostrophic wind as I always tell my students, whenever you see this equation, you have to know that pressure gradient is implicitly hidden in, in a geostrophic wind. So you shouldn't conclude there is no pressure gradient here. Pressure gradient is in this term because Vg is expressed like this. Now, I hope you can see that either of these two equations is a little bit of a mess. And what I mean by that is that depending on the sine of r and sine of delta phi over delta n, or consequently vg, we can get all kinds of solutions in terms of the sine. Some of them can be real numbers, some of them can be imaginary numbers. Now, that also means that only some combination of r and delta phi over delta n will give us physical solutions. And what I mean by physical is that v needs to be real and it needs to be non-negative. That is our requirement for V in natural coordinate system. So let's pick some signs for R and delta phi delta N and see what this equation will give us. So let's say, so example, let's say that R is positive and that means parcel is curving to the left 
in northern hemisphere where f is also positive and let's assume that delta phi delta n is negative or consequently that also means that vg is positive whichever one you want depending on the equation you use well this means counterclockwise rotation this means northern hemisphere and this is pressure gradient over here so counterclockwise northern hemisphere means we will have curvature like so turning to the left now if i pick point over here that means that velocity is tangent in my natural coordinate system that is v gradient again because r is positive that means that n will be like this positive and here somewhere is center of this curvature which means this is r now if we go beyond this figure and we go to either of these two equations we can see that we can analyze combination of these parameters by, by taking positive sign in front of the root or negative sign in front of the root so first let's take positive sign in front of the root that means that this quantity under the root over here will be positive for this choice of parameters namely r is positive so this will be positive vg is positive this will be positive and f is positive and this is positive because it's squared so this whole thing is positive and it also means it is larger than negative fr over 2 which is this term over here why is it larger well let's just assume that this term doesn't exist if you take square root you will see that these two are the same with positive sign therefore being same but opposite but this is not zero which means this is larger than this over here so this leads us to v gradient that will be a positive number and that makes sense and it is real number and this is called typical cyclonic flow cyclonic means counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere now because these forces are in balance and we now assume they are frozen in time that means this particle if it had trajectory over here like that i copy that trajectory over here and now i copy this part over here and now you see i close the oops i close the circle which means that trajectory will be circle and it will be counterclockwise direction in northern hemisphere okay well that was for positive root but for positive sign but what if we take now negative sign in, in front of this radical well in that case we will get that v gradient is negative and that is unphysical solution we get it's negative for the same reason that we got here that is positive this square root is larger than this term so when we take negative sign in front of it then the whole thing will be negative and we will have unphysical solution and for the sake of argument so let's say this was case one that we analyzed let's analyze case two i mean another example where we will have everything the same as here but reversal of pressure gradient so let's say r is positive f is positive and delta phi delta n is negative sorry what i wanted that's the same as here what i wanted to say is positive so everything is the same as one just change the sign of this that is equivalent of saying that v geostrophic is negative and now whichever of these two equations you analyze you will see that this number is actually smaller than this number so if you take positive then this ends up negative because of negative and if you take negative well you will just have two negative numbers in either of these two cases the result will give you that v gradient is a negative number and that is unphysical And now instead of me analyzing every possible situation,
I prepared here a nice table, as I often do, that summarizes all possible scenarios. So here we have solution of gradient wind equation in the northern hemisphere, where f is a positive number. The first column is pressure gradient term, or alternatively, it can be expressed through geostrophic wind. The second column is the case when we have positive curvature, and the third column is the case when we have negative curvature. We just analyzed this case, and we said we get two unphysical solutions. I also analyzed, in front of your eyes, this case over here, and we said we get one physical solution if we take positive sign in front of the root, and that's cyclonic regular flow, and we get unphysical solution if we take negative sign in front of the root. Without demonstrating here on a piece of paper, it easily can be shown that for negative R, if we take positive root under these conditions that pressure gradient is increasing with N, then we get something called anti-baric or anomalous low wind flow. Or if we take negative sign, we get unphysical solution. Don't worry, I will now sketch these how they look like. But I'm telling you what solutions would be. If we have delta phi delta n negative, as well as negative curvature, then we get two physical solutions. One is anticyclonic flow, which is regular high pressure system, a regular anticyclone in northern hemisphere. And we get another anticyclonic anti flow, but it's called anomalous high. Now I would kindly like you to notice something very, very interesting, which will blow your mind. If we take either of these anticyclonic flows, either regular high or anomalous high, and as I said, I will plot them soon. But regardless, whichever one we take, and we now look into this equation, these two equations over here, we can conclude that there is an upper limit that pressure gradient can take in order to get physical results for V gradient. Now I demonstrate what I mean by this. So we start by acknowledging that R is a negative number, which means either of these two equations, this will be, for example, negative number, but for this root to be real, this needs to be larger in magnitude than this negative number, which means we can see that f squared r squared over 4, this one, has to be larger than absolute f r v g. So r and one of these squares cancels, and we get that the requirement is that absolute value of v g needs to be smaller than absolute value of r times f squared over 4. Or, if you want this in terms of pressure gradients explicitly, then this we can rewrite as absolute delta phi delta n needs to be smaller than absolute r f squared over 4. And this is one of the best things in this video, this finding is so important. Why is this finding so important? Well, it's important because this inequality puts the upper limit on the horizontal pressure gradient in anticyclones or high pressure systems in our atmosphere. If we are close to the center of high pressure system, then this R becomes very small radius of curvature becomes very, very small, we are close to the center of the curvature. And that means, consequently, this delta phi delta n has to be even smaller to satisfy this inequality. And that is why high pressure systems in middle latitudes are very wide and pressure gradients close to the center are very weak and the winds are very, very weak. We say if you have high pressure system, winds are very weak or there is absence of winds. The weather is nice in summer, in winter, it is very cold and uh, not windy. Let me demonstrate that even more graphically. Let's say here 
I have a horizontal direction and I now plot pressure at a given height. Let's take I, this is height Z0, some reference height. How the pressure will look like in high pressure system in an anticyclone. Let's say here is the center of the anticyclone. Well, as we are moving towards the center, pressure at this height is increasing. But as I just said, close to the center, it cannot be very spiky. It has to be very small pressure gradient to satisfy this equation. But if I plot this same thing now for the low pressure system for, an, for a cyclone, then this inequality doesn't have to hold and the pressure gradients can be very steep close to the center like this. This is for L. And therefore, in this case, winds can be extremely strong close to the center of cyclone in respect to the center of anticyclone. And this is indeed what we experience in our atmosphere in everyday life. Just to show you that here I have a synoptic map of uh, 500 millibar geopotential height and associated winds at 500 millibars. And notice in this case how here is low pressure system, L, and over here we have high pressure system. I hope you can see that winds close to the center of low pressure systems are very strong in the counterclockwise direction here above North America. And here it's very broad pressure gradient. Look, it's not closely spaced isobars and winds are very, very weak. Now, I want you to remember something. This doesn't mean that cyclones cannot be like this. Cyclones can be broad and wide and maybe characterized by weak winds. The point is to say that anticyclones cannot be like this. That's the point of this analysis. The next thing that I would like to do now is to plot for you these four physical solutions that we found here and notice that in this table physical solutions are underlined. So first, let's plot this regular cyclonic flow. So that will look like, let's maybe do it here. Look like this, and this will be direction of motion. Here, gradient wind will be like so, V gradient. Here is the center of curvature. And that's a low pressure system, as we said. And we will have that the pressure gradient force is in this direction. That centrifugal force is in this direction. So this is CFF, centrifugal force, pressure gradient force. And Coriolis force is also in this direction. So these two forces balance the pressure gradient force. And this is called regular law. The next case that we have, let's plot this regular high. So what we will have is like this. And the flow will be clockwise in northern hemisphere. Here V gradient will be like this pressure because now this is high pressure system pressure gradient force will be in this direction from high to low pressure but notice that in this case centrifugal force is in the same direction as pressure gradient force which means Coriolis force has to balance both of these and this is called regular high. The next case that I would like to plot is related to anomalous law, this one over here. So we have circular motion again, uh, again, low pressure in the center. So it's anomalous low. And anomalous means that what we will have is that gradient winds are actually in the clockwise direction. That means anomalous. Pressure gradient force will be directed like this. 
So this will be pressure gradient force. Now I messed up my colors, I see. So this is pressure gradient force. And uh, Coriolis force is again to the right, always to the right of motion, Coriolis force. And centrifugal force is only force that needs to balance these two. This is called anomalous load. And lastly, let's plot anomalous high, where we will have high pressure in the center. If we take a parcel of air over here, it will have gradient wind like so. Pressure gradient force is acting from high to low pressure, which means in this direction. Coriolis force is to the right of the motion, which means in this direction. And centrifugal force is again in this direction. So Coriolis force needs to balance these two. And this is called anomalous high. So what you see now in front of your eyes are four physical solutions of gradient wind equation. Now let's notice something. Everywhere except anomalous low, pressure gradient force and Coriolis force are oppositely directed. And we call these baric flows. So this is also baric flow. This is called baric and this is called baric flow. This is called antibaric. In antibaric flows, geostrophic wind is actually negative, which means in antibaric flows, geostrophic wind would be horrible representation of real wind. Another thing to notice from these graphs is that the only cyclonic case is this one, and that is case when the centrifugal force and Coriolis force are in the same direction, or we would say have the same sense. Check my video on vectors. In all other cases, which are anti-cyclonic flows, notice that Coriolis force and centrifugal force always have opposite sense. Now, at the end of this video, I would like to do one more thing, and that is to find relationship between geostrophic wind and gradient wind. In other words, when is geostrophic wind stronger and when is, when is it weaker than gradient wind? To do that, we start from our equation that V gradient squared over R plus F V gradient plus delta phi delta N is equal to zero. This is just second momentum equation in the uh, natural coordinate system. And noticing that negative delta phi delta n is fvg, we can rewrite this equation as v gradient squared over r plus fv gradient minus fv geostrophic equals to zero. And now I will divide this by f and v gradient, and I get that v gradient over fr plus 1 minus v geostrophic over v gradient equals 0. Or, let's write it here, we can see if we express this in terms of v geostrophic over v gradient, then this is equal 1 plus v gradient over fr. So what do we conclude from this result over here? Well, we see that if, well, let me write here, if FR is positive, V geostrophic is larger than V gradient, which means geostrophic wind would be overestimation of gradient wind. On the other hand, if we have that FR is negative, well, that would mean that V geostrophic is smaller than V gradient, or we could say that geostrophic wind is an underestimate of V gradient. And it is time to get new marker, as you can see. Of course, I hope 
that some of you that are now sticking with me for a long time on this channel can immediately recognize that this parameter over here is nothing else but Rossby number. So we can say that Vg over V gradient is equal 1 plus Rossby number, where Rossby number measures the strength of Coriolis force compared to inertial forces. So for example, in tropical regions, Rossby number is uh, between 1 and 10, and that means that this can become very large number, so gradient wind is much, much better representation of wind in tropics than geostrophic wind. In mid-latitudes, the difference between geostrophic and gradient wind is approximately 10 to 20 percent, usually not larger than that. So this is mid-latitudes. This was gradient wind balance in all of its glory. If you are studying synoptic meteorology, this is something you have to know. There is no other way around. I suggest, if you really want to understand these concepts, then it's never enough to just watch video. You have to do things on your own. This video serves only to help you if you get stuck somewhere. If you want to become expert in this field, you have to derive these equations on your own. You have to solve some problems on your own to get physical feeling for this problem. However, I will try to help you even with problem solving because several videos from now I am planning to have one very long video where I will just solve various problems related to atmospheric dynamics because over the last year, year and a half, I introduced so many different and important concepts in atmospheric sciences in particularly atmospheric dynamics and synoptic meteorology, and I would like to solve several interesting problems using these concepts. Until next video, goodbye.